No, it was serious legwork trying to build a relationship with companies. <laughs> Uh, impenetrable <laughs> totally impenetrable yeah what a what a wet wet rag of a human <laughs> stick in the mud <laughs> uh, we um we really just yeah. like from the very beginning and we, we've said it so many times but like even from those first couple of video calls that we had with each other we really like hit it off Hello, and welcome to the SAG AFTRA Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Joe Newmeyer, film critic for New York's 710 AM WOR Radio. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the stars of Prime Video's The Peripheral, Chloe Grace Moretz and Jack Rayner. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having us. Hi, our pleasure. Congratulations on The Peripheral, the first season of which recently debuted its first eight episodes on Prime Video, and it's an extraordinary, immersive dive into smart, character-rich science fiction. No surprise, as it's from a novel by William Gibson, created by Scott Smith, and executive produced by Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. Chloe, to start off with, uh, your character, Flynn Fisher, is as complex as they come, existing as she is in two eras, the Blue Ridge Mountains, yeah. specifically North Carolina in the year 2032, and London in 2100, thanks to what appears to be a VR headset and other amazing plot twists that we won't give away. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Talk to us, Chloe, about how you got a handle on Flynn and the different levels that she exists in, one a human and one a robot, and what were some keys to portraying both of those levels for you? Um... Yeah, you know, it was it was a lot of fun being able to to play with all the kind of different angles and, and, and shapes of Flynn Fisher. And, and I think one thing is, you know, she grows up in a small town. And I think anyone that kind of understands what it's like to grow up in a small town is everyone kind of treats you the exact same as when you were all 12 years old. It's like when you go back home for the holidays and you all revert to being teenagers again. And one thing that we had a lot of fun with was really showing the difference is when she gets to future London and not only is she physically, you know, completely different in terms of her outfit is much more fitted and, you know, she's in a robot body, so she's a lot more, um, I guess, perfected in a lot of ways, quote unquote. Um, but ultimately her relationship with, uh, with Gary Carr's character, how he's meeting her exactly as a woman she is in that moment and kind of how she can show exactly who she is to him instead of all the preconceived notions you have from growing up with the same people for so long. So it was really fun to kind of shape those different edges of her and to find those little pieces. And then just in terms of being a robot, <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun to play with because there's a lot out there on um, people who have played robots. And, and so we really wanted to differentiate that, especially when she wakes up uh, into the robot body, which happens in multiple sequences and trying to figure out how should I wake up? How does she come to consciousness? And then when the AI takes over, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah. Jack, you play Burton Fisher, the brother of Flynn Fisher. And Burton is an ex-Marine whose experiences in battle prepped him for the revelations of what's happening in London 70 years in the future. And he's also the reason the plot kicks into motion in a lot of ways. What were some keys and essential things about Burton that helped you click into what he was, uh, what he was all about, Jack? Um, well, similarly, actually, to what Chloe said, you know, there's the kind of small town mentality element of it and um, that kind of cohesiveness among groups of, you know, young people and young guys in, in a small town. And that's something that I have a lot of experience of, you know, growing up in the countryside in County Wicklow in Ireland. Yeah. Um, and I had done some kind of military films before. Um, and I'd work closely with some uh, Navy SEALs and Marines and Royal Marines in the UK and stuff like that. And um, so I had a bit of an insight into that world, too. Um, and I think, you know, one of the big influences for me when it came to portraying a character who had this kind of um, shared sort of level of consciousness with with other people in his unit, uh, it made me think about um something that I've seen a lot of at home here, which is when people play session music together. It's a really interesting thing where people are like non-verbally communicating with one another and picking up cues from one another to be able to kind of create this one singular thing in a piece of music. Um, and so I thought about that a lot before we came to shoot the show. And, um, you know, that got me into thinking about bands I love from that part of the world that Flynn and Burton are from. Um, and, you know, the influence of that music. So I got on to listening to the band a lot, who are actually one of my favorite 
groups. Um, and Lee Von Helm became a really big influence for me for the character, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's the very quick, broad explanation for you. I can I can see that now that you say that I can actually see a little bit of Levon Helm in the in your in your performance. That's a great uh, that's a great inspiration. Oh. Yeah, something that Jack said, Chloe, reminds me of the, the if if Burton is sort of kind of working as a as a cohesive unit because as we find out in the show, that's sort of part of the the dynamic that the that the core was going for with with him and his friends that they recruited. Yeah. Uh, Flynn is Flynn is uh, you know her revelations in some ways come through uh, her 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 haptic drift her kind of you know kind of learning empathy she in some ways has to go from being a loner to learning a little bit of cohesion and learning to be part of a group and kind of understanding what that's about in ways she wasn't anticipating right yeah I mean I think that that you know I think a lot of her life she has kind of been alone you know once uh, Burton kind of goes off to war. She's left alone, you know, uh, at the with the family house and her father passes away and, you know, her mother gets sick and and she's kind of the only one that's that's, uh, you know, the pillar of, of, of their family at that point in time. And then when Burton comes home, I think there is a little bit of rub between them and the fact that she's been taking care of so much for so long. But he's coming home from obviously being, you know, uh, uh, a you know, strong war veteran and going through stuff that I could never imagine. And then, you know, going into the future and, and seeing how she's experiencing so much on her own that he has no idea of either. And there is this kind of situation where he tries to control that for a little while. And then she kind of butts up against him and, and, um, and, 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 and talks about what, you know, she needs in their relationship and, and how they can do this together, but they got to do it, you know, as a unit, but also give each other their own space. And I think that is kind of the, the biggest thing for Jack and I, I think during this whole show was we really felt that like, Jack, uh, I'm sorry, we really felt that Flynn and Burton held down so much of the story for each other. So no matter how far we went into the future, we always kind of came back home and came back together. And so it was interesting kind of playing, you know, really in a, a completely different show, being in the future with a different cast and having all these experiences and coming back to Clanton and having to figure out how she's going to, you know, navigate that with her brother. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's like it's it's two two different shows, but also they kind of merge in so many ways, and it's uh, it's they beautifully complement each other. And in fact, actually, Chloe, that reminds me that obviously for all of the the sci-fi uh, conceits and ideas, and we'll talk about some of those and some of those those deeper ideas in a moment. But the familial relationships in the peripheral are so vital, and the sibling bond that that you both have on the show is, is so real and dynamic and sometimes funny. How was it for both of you guys building that? that report, Jack, we can start with you maybe. And is it true that I, yeah, you guys, I read that you guys uh, met on Facebook and had Facebook uh, conversations or not Facebook, but uh, Zoom conversations. FaceTime, was FaceTime, yeah, we, we had a couple of- Before you met, it sort of works with the, the conceit of the show, right? We yeah. had a couple of calls, all right, yeah. yeah. No, it was serious legwork trying to build a relationship with people. <laughs> uh, impenetrable, totally impenetrable. Yeah, <laughs> what, a, what a wet, wet rag of a human. <laughs> <laughs> stick in the mud <laughs> uh, we um we really just yeah. like from the very beginning and we, we've said it so many times but like even from those first couple of video calls that we had with each other we really like hit it off um and i mean obviously it was a really exciting project you know just because of the sum of its parts before um we came to shoot it but you know after me and chloe had spoken a few times i just i was really really excited to work with her and i knew that we were going to have a great time together and um you know like when you you know particularly for chloe like this i think if correct me if i'm mistaken but this is chloe's first foray into television and you know like it's a different animal it's a different kind of workload and you're dealing with maybe 600 pages rather than 120 on a feature. You know what I mean? Um, so with that comes a unique set of challenges. And I think, you know, when you're in the endurance test of television, yeah. it's great to have people who, you know, you can really rely on their support and you can, you know, just be comfortable and know that you've got a buddy there with you at the end of the day. And we certainly had that with each other on the show. Um, which you know that that makes it that makes it work that makes it fun and and doable you know so I think we were both relieved to have that for sure yeah yeah Chloe how about you from your point of view uh I mean yeah it was it was exactly that I think the first time that um 
we talked, we had, we had actually just reached out to the production at the same time. And we we're like, can we get on a FaceTime together so we can just like meet and, and chat. And we got on and I think we like first talked for like two or three hours and we talked about nothing about the show. We just talked about our lives and each other and then, and, and things in our, in our, our histories and, and just these kind of wild intricacies of overlap in our lives that were really, really similar as if we were siblings in some circumstances. Um, and then once we kind of got to London and we had 14 days or I think it was 10 days of quarantine apart, but we spent every day going through the scenes and, and reading the scripts together on FaceTime. And so we spent those 10 days, like basically quarantine, just like chatting to each other and bonding. And so by the time we actually met in person for the first time, I think the rest of the production team and the cast was like, what the hell a little bit? <laughs> because we were, we were, you know, in lockstep with each other, finishing each other's sentences like brother and sister. Um, and then I think once the accent started to flow, it, it really made us seem like brother and sister. Right. So it was a lot of fun though. We, we had so much fun on set. We were playing Nintendo half the time, you know, they were trying to peel us out of our trailers while we were playing video games together. So not ordering, loads of, ordering loads of food on Uber Eats. At lunch eating, time. Yeah. And eating everything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that notion of the, of the fact that the two of you guys bonded in some ways uh, before actually meeting face to face on set because it does kind of go it, it is in uh, it, it echoes in a lot of ways the show. Yeah. It uh, is on brand, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe we can try and get very peripheral or trying to get that in the lexicon. That's very peripheral. I like that. Oh yeah, and then like we'll play we'll play Call of Duty online now, and then we're like talking through headsets from across the world, and we are like. There's just a little bit too much similarity, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of living it in a way, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Well, we mentioned those uh, so many of the great deep ideas in the show, and Chloe, the show has so many deep themes, and like the best speculative fiction echoes today. You know what's happening today, issues that we're dealing with, and mm-hmm. as Jonathan Nolan has said, William Gibson sort of reinvented science fiction. What aspects of the show's story, maybe its its existential ideas, the themes about class and oppression, and AI and technology. Did you maybe look into as part of your research or what really resonated with you about the show's ideas? Well, I think there's something, you know, that we both really grasp onto about the book that I feel like we touched on in season one that I hope, you know, God willing, if we're able to do a season two, that we can kind of go further into, which is the the financial aspect of it, you know, and that's something that isn't really talked about a lot. And, and it touches on it throughout the season, but it was something that was always in the back of our heads while we were filming. And we were always kind of talking about this, you know, the severity of it, because when she logs in that first time, before she even gets in the peripheral, when we first meet her and Burton together inside that trailer, the reason that she puts the headset on, like, yeah, she's, she's, you know, loves gaming and it's a lot of fun and she's really good at it, but they need the money from Mama's Tamazine. And so there's always this driving kind of heartbeat behind it that the financial aspect of the show and the fact that they're getting this money means that their mother can hopefully survive. And that was one thing for, for Flynn that I felt was every time she goes to the future, she's having fun. Sure. It's an exciting experience, but ultimately she wants to save the situation that her family is currently in, in their real life. And when what starts to happen in the future puts an impending doom in their current reality that people are trying to come and kill them and hurt their family, she's going to do anything she can to protect her family and those that love her. And, you know, ultimately continue to try to take care of the family. And so there was a, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, when you get to the end of the season, I won't talk about too much, but I think the decision she makes is a really, really intense decision um, in terms of protecting her family and trying to save their lives. Um, and that's a decision that is kind of polarizing. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing that uh, and, and being able to play that and kind of put yourself in a situation where I'm excited, you know, I say this all the time with, with the show, but I'm excited to see what happens in season two, because I feel like season one set us up for so much. And there's, there's so much more that we can dive into in season two between the decisions that have been made. Yeah. yeah. I love that aspect of the show as well. That, that, that sort of sense of that, the people's uh, what the needs of their lives drive the decisions that they make and, and drive big movements and whether it's in technology or, or in, uh, in, in revolutions and things like that. And Jack, one of the things that's crucial about Burton is that, uh, while so many of the characters on the peripheral are mysterious with unseen motives, Burton's kind of an action hero, which I which I love. He's got there's complexity to him as well. But that's a great kind of poetry in there as well, isn't that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I think there's a real earnestness with the character, and um, you know, like he's kind of a he's kind of reliable in the way that like you know that he's like striving to do the right thing, and 
his his means might not always be uh you know the nicest way of going about it but uh he's trying to he's trying to do what's best um and you know that was fun it's nice to play a character like that and like you say the action part of it like over the last few years now i've had some you know i've i've had some great opportunities in my career but there hasn't really been anything that's been as action heavy as this um and that was like a lot of fun just to get into something where i knew i was going to be doing a lot of stunts every day and it was going to be very physical um and you know that's really cool it's great to do that every now and again yeah yeah and the action beats in the series is so terrific as well and, mm -hmm. and chloe uh jack mentioned this but this is your first time exploring a character's arc over 700 800 pages and eight months of filming eight hours of of uh of story and and as you said and greg plageman the executive producer and showrunner really makes all of it flow so beautifully is there a sort of rhythm or pacing that you have to sort of reset to use a word that that happens a few times in the show to kind of reset kind of your acting barometer in some ways to build across eight episodes to kind of hit those emotional points is there kind of a different rhythm that you get into as a performer um yeah i mean it was it was 117 days and i worked 113 so it was it was a really a really brutal a really brutal uh <laughs> I don't know, schedule, it was intense. But um, I think, you know, in the beginning, we found out that we we're gonna be cross-boarded, which means we were shooting anywhere from episode one through eight in one day. Uh, we had two directors, which was nice that we only had two, I think compared to a lot of shows, you'll sometimes be dealing with four or five, six, seven, eight directors. Um, and so, you know, what I really felt the best way to go about it was to be able to kind of have a map and knowing that we were going to be shooting one through eight in a day, that means I'm going to be in future London. I'm going to be in present Clanton. I'm going to be with two different, uh, you know, groups of people, different directors. The best way to go about it would be like color coding in a lot of ways. So I had them print all the scripts in miniatures. So uh, then we would color code them and then we would color code the one line. And so that way we would know that when we got the call sheet that day, we could see that we were going to do red, green and blue. And that meant four, two and, and seven. And there was a way that we could, you know, have the miniature scripts with us on set, read the scenes prior to right before, whether I'm coming from future London into Clanton, or if, you know, Jack and I just, you know, had a scene in the trailer and we're now shooting in the living room and we're doing this three months apart, we could read through the scene, know that we were, what we were going to be doing and take it on kind of head on. And that was a uh, kind of a lifesaver in a lot of ways, because there's a lot of moments later in the season where we're coming in and out of future London to Clanton really seamlessly and really quickly. And she's finding out a lot of information and then kind of walking into different situations and keeping it secret. So I really wanted to make sure that that subtext was always there, that, you know, what she had just heard or what she had just did in London was in the back of her mind um, and kind of omnipresent. Uh, and so it was, it was, it was hard, you know, and, and just body wise, we were also dealing with COVID. So we were filming in a time where we were getting tested twice a day, every day, literally twice a day, every day. Um, and I mean, knock on wood, neither Jack or I got it during filming and we were able to kind of keep going. We got quarantined a couple of times, but we didn't get it during filming. Um, and, you know, we were able to kind of trudge through and that's a, it's a huge, um, you know, thank you to the production team that, that really kept it afloat during really hard times. I think there was one point where we were the only show still filming in sure. London. We were the only show. Yep. That's yeah, everyone was shut down. It was crazy. It's crazy. And that's because of Jim Scotchable, our our producer on set. Like he he headed up all of that, and he was a complete badass about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. the the result is obviously you guys you guys made it happen so so perfectly. It it it's intricate. It, it brings up the idea that Flynn is. Flynn's tough, but also vulnerable and constantly figuring things out as is, you know, Burton. There's an immediacy to these characters, sort of a minute by minute quality that what I love is what you just described, Chloe, is that the, there's a technical aspect to it that it's it's almost like the old the old saying of, you know, if things come easily, if you if you've got your preparation, if you're prepared. And so once you have all that that technical uh, you know, the figuring out of, of where you're going to be in, in each moment, because the, the two stories are so are so disparate and so so vivid then that, that moment by moment quality, that kind of emotional immediacy comes easily in some ways, or it's easier, right? I mean, hundred percent. I, I, I've always viewed um, acting in that way for me, at least I, I like to do 
as much upfront work as I can, like possibly can read through it as many times, walk through it as many times and feel like we have it so ingrained into our bodies that by the time we go to do it, we don't have to look at anything and we can just exist and make decisions on behalf of the character that are realistic and that, you know, make sense within the scope of the character in that moment. Um, and with this one, you know, I think that's exactly that's exactly the way we went about it, especially with things like the accents, because we're also dealing with a southern accent in this certain area. Accents very similar to, you know, in Ireland or England, I'm sure you go a couple of miles in either direction, the accents start to shift and change and completely manipulate. And so we, you know, we all I think everyone in the cast was was that was that was in Clanton we're really on it about trying to stay in inside the same box, especially Jack and I. And we just kind of went and would talk through with the accent all the time. And yeah. it was a really fun kind of collaborative experience between us with that. And Chloe, to wrap up, I read that uh, you are a, a, you're adept at gaming, something that the characters of obviously Burton and Flynn are as well, which you just mentioned earlier, uh, as part of the world building of the series. I thought it was interesting that a lot of your avatars online are, are guys, are male characters, uh, except for Final Fantasy, I think I read, right? Yeah, Final Fantasy is my only one. That's right? Right. <laughs> I'm wondering if that in some in some ways kind of helped us. I mean, obviously everything helps as an actor, right? Trying to, trying to incorporate different aspects of things that you, in your life, or things that you know, or things that you've read, uh, and sort of processing or figuring out a role uh in a way even a small way right did that help as you played Flynn just kind of that aspect of it a hundred percent I mean it, it is always nice I mean it's fun honestly in both ways like I really love playing characters that are similar to who I am like Flynn it was exciting because I think quite frankly it was one of my more vulnerable roles in the sense that I was showing a lot of myself inside the character and a lot of the responses and a lot of the shape of her is very similar to the way I would go about that experience or, or being in that situation. Um, there was a lot of familial similarities in terms of the loss of one of her parents. And there was a lot of things that I kind of had to dredge up that, you know, honestly, like, you know, Jack can, can talk about it too, but like, I really leaned on him in those experiences during filming, which was at the very beginning of our, our filming as well. And I think that helped make it even more cohesive and make us feel even closer like brother and sister. And kind of being able to um, take away the veil of acting a little bit and be kind of vulnerable and just exist in the moment was really beautiful. And on the flip side of that, it's also really fun to play, you know, a character that is nothing like yourself and you're fitting yourself into a completely different box and stripping everything away and and completely manipulating yourself into this character. Um, and I think they, you know, they're two halves of the same whole in a lot of ways, and they can be incredibly vulnerable uh, in both aspects. Um, and so... You know, this one, there was a lot of there. I think there was a lot of rawness and being able to actually be a gamer and be a gamer inside the show and and have all those intricacies be shown on screen was exciting, but also a little a little scary for sure. Yeah, of but. course. Yeah. Jack, how about let's kind of talk about the emotionalism in that respect. Like Chloe just mentioned, you kind of being able to kind of bring that a level of vulnerability and things to the to the performance. Obviously, once you're once you've got him figured out, you know, there, that's an important aspect of Burton and an important aspect of the whole series. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, like, as we've already said, um, there, there are some kind of uncanny similarities in my life and Chloe's life. And uh, we've had some similar experiences with certain things. And, um, you know, with the relationship that we were able to build between one another before we started the show, uh, we felt safe enough to kind of draw on some of those experiences with one another in some of the more emotionally intimate scenes, I suppose you would say. Um, and that stuff for us was always really critical to the authenticity of the show and to the performances as well, you know? Like, I think you really, really need to believe in the emotional intimacy of this brother and sister in, in order for the show to work, you know, and for the stakes to be there. Um, so, yeah, that was just so, that was so important for us. And again, thankfully, uh, you know, you're working with somebody who you really trust and, you know, who you, you, you're personally invested in. And so then that's achievable, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's wrap up also by saying, uh, what do you guys hope that people take away from the show? And Jack, we can start with you. Uh, kind of what do you hope pe viewers take away from from watching the peripheral? There's so many ideas in it and so, much, so many emotions and so many things that echo inside of it. What do you hope uh, folks take away? Well, look, first and foremost, I hope people just like enjoy the experience of it. I hope people just think it's a fun show and they just like to sit down and watch it. You know what I mean? There's so much out there at the minute to watch. 
there's a lot of very demanding TV. Um, and, you know, I think that hopefully this is something that people will just sit down and enjoy. Beyond that, you know, it does bring up issues and themes that are um, indicative of where we might be going in terms of the climate, you know, geopolitically, et cetera. Um, and I think that the keystone really of the show is about, you know, people's, you know, relationships with those closest to them and how we kind of have to try and do right by ourselves and the people that we love in order to make the world a better place, you know, for, for lack of a better cliche. And so I think that's kind of, that's the kind of stuff I hope people take away from it. Yeah. Empathy is such a crucial element of the show in a lot of ways. And and part of the title of of one of the episodes I know. Chloe, how about you? What would you hope uh, viewers take away from it? Honestly, pretty much the exact same thing that Jack said. I mean, I, I, I hope that first and foremost, people really enjoy the show in terms of the expansiveness of it. You know, it really is, a show that you can, can get lost in very quickly. And now with episode one through eight being out, you know, being able to stay with those characters for that amount of time and see the journey, it is it is really exciting. You know, we had incredible production design, uh, set design, costume design, uh, hair and makeup. It is, it is just an exciting show to devour as a viewer. But on top of that, you know, I really... For me, I think what hits me the most with the show is is the is really the aspect between Flynn and Burton and their strong, strong family connection and how, you know, against all odds, they're really going to be there for each other. And no matter how far they get into, you know, the situation that they found themselves in, that they kind of always have each other's back. Uh, and there is a really uh, strong amount of, of conversation about empathy. And and, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a also a view of the South that we've never really seen. And being from Georgia and being from the South, it was really fun to be a part of a show. I think that that sheds light onto um, an aspect of the South that we haven't really seen depicted on screen. Um, And it felt really wonderful to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the production design, production design, set design uh, costumes are amazing and the supporting cast around both of you is is really top notch. It's a fantastic show. It's exciting. It engages your heart and your brain, which is always so valuable and, and so terrific. Thank you both so much for your time and congratulations again. The first season is available on Prime Video. On behalf of the SAG AFTRA Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, process and craft with your fellow performers. Ladies and gentlemen, Chloe Grace Moretz and Jack Rayner. And the show is The Peripheral. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>